It is September 15th, 2017. My name is Rich Schmidt. I'm here at Ponzi Vineyards with, with Louisa Ponzi. And Louisa, we're gonna start you off by asking why wine? Why wine? Oh, was there something else? Did I have an option? Um, <laughs> wine, uh, you know, that's been my life. We started the winery when I was two. So all of my, you know, recollection is of wine. Not necessarily wine, but everything that comes into wine. So really my childhood is, is more about the vineyards and working in the vineyards and working in the cellar. Um, the end result, of course, being wine. But uh, yeah, I don't know. I, that, there's no other, there was never any other uh, thought. I mean, I had a diversion, of course. Everybody kind of goes off their way. And if you grow up in this industry, especially in the 70s and 80s when we were around, uh, it was not glamorous and it wasn't uh, what it is today. Mm -hmm. There was no recognition. There was no um, fancy cars or, you know, anything. <laughs> it was hard work. And uh, we were the labor force, my sister, brother, and I. So we were pretty willing to leave as quickly as we could. And as teenagers, it became even more untasteful. <laughs> um, so yeah, so, you know, the only, the only other option that I pursued at one point was medicine. And, uh, but, pretty quickly realized that this is in my blood. This is, this is what I know, this is what I love. And when I left it, it was pretty clear. So coming back was easy. <laughs> yeah. So growing up, like you said you, you were growing up in the, in the industry, in the winery. What was the kind yeah. of the family dynamic like and what were the kind of expectations for you like? There were no expectations. And I think that was key um, to coming back was that there was no obligation or expectation that any of us would. I don't, uh, I don't know that we would have if that was put on us. Um, so that's pretty key to uh, let the next generation make their choice. Um, the, the family dynamic was, um, we, we are a family that works. It's what we do, honestly. Um, we uh, have done every single step of this together and uh, that was the point. My parents wanted to do something as a family. That was the whole point. It wasn't about an industry. It wasn't about any great goals about Oregon. Uh, it was a little bit about Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, um, but it, it was mostly get back to the land, do something with your family that we can all participate in um, as kids. And that's what we did. You know, We worked in the vineyards. We helped build the rock walls at the old winery. We worked in the cellars. We tailed around with my mother as she tried to sell wine. I mean, there was lots that we did. It was all together. and. Uh, it was a beautiful dynamic. I mean, you know, bottling days when I was 10, 11 years old were super fun. I'm, you know, hanging out with my grandma who's doing the vending machine and I've got my brother over there who's, you know, filling the bottles. And those are the memories that I have. Sitting around the table, talking about wine. <laughs> we're Italian, so lots of good food. Um, you know, there was a point where you say, Jesus, is there anything else that we can talk about? Is, you know, <laughs> that all we do? Um, and it was kind of all we do. Um, but yeah, we work. That's what we do together. And um, dream a little bit at a certain point. You know, we started a brewery back in the 80s. Um, we built this facility in the last decade. So, you know, it's been a lot of fun. <laughs> Very fortunate. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So I know when you, when you sort of decided to head into wine, you traveled to France uh, yeah. to kind of pursue that. Tell me a little bit about that experience. Yeah. So. Um, so like I said, I kind of diverted off into medicine thinking, um, I love science. So, so there's three kids, I'm the youngest, and uh, I was always the one that was more interested in what was happening in the, in the vineyard and the cellar and kind of getting dirty. Um, I, loved, I loved that whole process. Um, and science uh, was my thing in high school and through, through my education. I got a degree, a science degree in, uh, at PSU. Uh, thinking pre-med and uh, at a certain point after working at OHSU, the university hospital a little bit, um, realized that environment wasn't really my thing after, you know, growing up in the outdoors and having this, you know, kind of real tactile experience. Um, I figured, I found out that, you know, medicine was probably not my thing. I also realized you needed a lot of empathy for people. I wasn't really good at that. <laughs> there, was, there was things I was missing. <laughs> and so, um, so I, uh, 
I kind of got stuck there. That was early 90s, and my father um, very cleverly, in his very non-pushy way, said, well, come back and um, work the harvest. That was 91. Um, come help me with this vintage. Just tell you, get your feet on the ground, figure out what your next step is. And he cleverly put me in the lab, that vintage. <laughs> and um, that was when I made that kind of connection of science and chemistry and art and the whole, um, you know, how wine is influenced by what you do. Uh, before that, it just seemed like a lot of work, manual work. So um, that, was, that was a little bit of a light bulb and I was like, well, maybe I should look at this. This is, this is pretty interesting. Um, at that point, I cultivated quite a love for wine. Um, and so considered going to Davis and decided that uh, at that point in this industry, really Burgundy was the best um, kind of role model of what we were doing with, with our varietals and our climate. So found this great school. We had some nice connections in Burgundy um, that my parents had cultivated over the years. And so I uh, was able to work in some domains that were uh, really tremendous impact on me um, and went to a really great little school. And uh, it was kind of the school for the next generation of the Burgundian domain. So it was all the sons and daughters and um, they were all kind of facing the same things I was. You know, do I want to do this? Uh, you know, what does this mean for my life? Uh, do I love it? Um, how can I change what my parents were doing? Um, so that was great. That environment was really cool because there was a lot of other than wine. I got a, I got a lot of this kind of generational stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, had the opportunity to just taste tons of good wine. I mean, that was what that year, well, it was about 18 months, um, was about, was just training my palate. And when I came back, and that kind of solidified it for me, I, I did some work down in um, Piedmont mm -hmm. um, and uh, finished my uh, degree there in Bone and came back and took over in 93 from my father, who was very willing to let go. <laughs> he, was, he was ready. He'd been making wine for... 20 years, 21 years, I guess, sure. at that point. And uh, so he was happy to, to kind of make that transition. So, yeah. Tell me about that. Did you, you must have felt some sort of pressure taking over for your dad and taking over the, the family name. Yeah, that, that is true. I mean, he was making good wines and he was, uh, really had claimed uh, a lot of recognition for the area. Um, and uh, it was a high standard for sure. Um, he was amazing, and I, I don't know if there's something about a father-daughter transition that maybe is a little bit easier than father-son. It was not confrontational or competitive or any kind of um, anything like that. It was, it was very much he wanted me to um, experiment as much as I wanted to. A lot of the experimentation I did, he'd done decades before and knew the answers, but let me repeat his mistakes. <laughs> um, so he was very open to letting me kind of take the reins and, and do what I want with it, but kind of looking over my shoulder because there was a reputation at that point. We were uh, starting to actually make a little money off the winery and so he was able to quit his day job. Um, so there was, there was a, a little bit of pressure there <laughs> to continue uh, making good wines. So, um, I think it was like 96 where I finally felt like he'd really kind of backed off and said, okay, you're, you're, you got this. Um, the place where I felt like I could really impact quality was, um, was our vineyards. Mm -hmm. uh, we were starting to develop new vineyards in the early 90s and I had uh, the opportunity to come in and really try experiments with clones and rootstocks and spacing and all kinds of things that he hadn't been able to do. Uh, Chardonnay was the only one that he was just it wasn't making good Chardonnay and, and the region wasn't known for Chardonnay and I had just come back from drinking white burgundies and I was like, oh my gosh, we got to make Chardonnay. So, so Chardonnay was exciting. That was, that was the place where I felt like I got to make the Pinots, you know, keep them at this standard, but I can improve Chardonnay here. We can do something with this. So um, yeah, there was some pressure, but it wasn't uh, tremendous. And, and I know in those early days, whenever I had a bad review, I was cringe, you know, like, ah, <laughs> <laughs> terrible. Um, and when you got a good review, it was great. I, I don't even look at reviews anymore, which is really nice. Uh, but you know, yeah, you're, you feel like people are looking at you. Sure. And, and it's taken a long time. I think there's people out in the world that still think my father makes the wine, even though I've been doing this for 25 years. Um, you know, it's still, you know, Dick Ponzi and, 
and it took a long time to kind of people to understand that there had been a change so yeah and you're not the only one with the transition your sister did a similar thing sort of taking over that. yeah so. she she did it from a, on a different route a little bit so she uh, as I said we all kind of took off uh, to pursue other things and she did journalism on the East Coast um, and uh, worked at a magazine for quite a long time, living in Boston. And in the same kind of way as we all did, felt um, at a certain level like you were missing out. Like, like every time Harvest rolled around, you were kind of like, what am I doing? You know, why aren't I back there? And um, I think she, she figured out um, that if she was gonna work really hard, she'd rather do it for herself and for something she loves. So um, she came back armed with really good skills in, in um, not only writing and journalism, but uh, marketing. She'd done a lot of marketing and PR and things like that and took over that a few years before I came back. So she was already here. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a great balance. She's, she's very much loves her, that's my puppy, she's looking for me. <laughs> she loves her, her uh, path that she's taken and uh, she would hate to do what I'm doing and I would hate to do what she's doing so it all works out because I can't stand sales and she doesn't like getting dirty. <laughs> it works out well. So it works out well, yeah, it, it is and, and you find your, if you find your path it's, you know, that's, that's the magic, so. So how would you say your winemaking style differs from your dad's? <sighs> um, how does it differ? It doesn't differ that much, honestly, if uh, I'm talking Pinot Noir. Um, he taught me, um, and it was reinforced in Burgundy, uh, about uh, very gentle handling of Pinot Noir. I mean, he was at the forefront of really teaching people about that. Uh, he used to do seminars around the country teaching people about um, Pinot Noir and how it was different than other grapes, and you had to be careful and you had to look at process. He's a mechanical engineer, so he loved looking at process. Um, looking at your equipment, you know, the details of the winemaking and, and how it has to adapt to the varietal. Um, so that was ingrained in me. That was kind of my deal was there's a certain way you treat Pinot. So really, uh, yeah, I didn't change um, a lot with Pinot Noir. The, the changes came to me, kind of um, bigger uh, variety of um, choices with vineyards, with the industry growing, you know. I had a lot of people that, that wanted to sell fruit, so that was fun. A lot of new sites to try. We expanded our vineyards by almost a double um, in the early 90s, so um, it was more volume. It was more learning how to kind of make more wine. Mm. He was making little bits of wine, and um, that's kind of how it works. When you have more family members come back, you have to actually grow the business. And so, <laughs> so uh, it was more learning how to make the same quality wines on a larger scale, which is a learning curve, mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and the ability to work with new sites, the ability, all the tools that came, you know, a, a little later in the industry, mm -hmm. um, knowledge, you know, there, there was a lot that I could bring that he didn't have the ability to access. So that was the biggest change, I think, for me. We still make wines essentially in the style he made wines, small lots, mm -hmm. um, very gentle handling, very hands-off, um, uh, but on a larger scale. So. so beyond that, do you have what you call, consider like a winemaking philosophy? Um, I, I know the kind of wines I like, like and I, I aspire to make. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm always looking for um, wines that have some um, textural element to them, that have some backbone and, and, and uh, structure. I like structured wines, white or red. Um, I like wines that uh, really do show place that you can, can uh, tell somewhere in the world that they came from, maybe not that vineyard, but somewhere in the world that there's some, some identification to it. Um, and I think you can only do that by, by really letting the vineyards speak, which is very cliche, but I think that's really how it works, is, is um, allowing the whatever vintage variation there is kind of be there and not try to manipulate or overcome that and, and work around it to kind of make the most complete wines you can within those parameters of what happened for that year. Um, so for me, that just really does mean letting the wine speak, a lot of patience, a lot of um, step back and just observe and not react too quickly so yeah 
Did you have to kind of grow into that philosophy or have you kind of always had it? No, you grow into it, you know, you grow into it eventually over time it all becomes intuitive and, and you're not looking at um, numbers anymore and you're not looking at uh, what your neighbor's doing. It, it's kind of becomes intuitive. You're, 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 you're looking at it at all. So it comes through the door, you're looking at it in the vineyards, you're kind of just putting it together in your brain and then when it happens you're, I don't know, it just happens. <laughs> You kind of know at that point, and, and I, I have a lot of people that come work for me now, the interns that come from all over the world, and they, they want to learn and learn and learn, and I, I, I think I'm a little frustrating to them because I don't give them probably what they want, and because so much of it I can't put into words mm -hmm. as to why, why am I making the decision. I don't know, it just seems like we should. <laughs> I, so, so that's, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a nice feeling to get to this point where you've been doing it long enough where you have that. Um, you don't have this anxiety over, really, I feel like anything could be thrown at us and I can figure it out. Um, it's not a, it's not a, it's, it, it's a challenge, but it's not um, stressful anymore. Mm. <laughs> it's kind of fun, yeah. So what are some of your, the biggest, speaking of challenges, biggest yeah. challenges and successes you've had as a winemaker? Um, I think, well, one of the biggest challenges was moving to a new facility. So, you know, when you've been in a place for over 30, 40 years, uh, you know that place, you know what, how it reacts, how temperature changes, how, you know, um, if you put something in this corner, it's going to get warmer than if you put it up on this stack over here. You know, you really get to know it. Uh, when we moved to this facility, which is, is huge um, by comparison to what we were doing, which was our garage, basically, mm -hmm. um, that was scary because that was a little bit like, and we're doing all wild yeast. So you've got this amazing culture growing, you know, in this cellar that you've been using for so long. Is that going to transfer up here? Where, where does what you know what happens there? Is that magic? Is that something we need? So <laughs> I don't know. That was scary because because it was all new and uh, it felt uh, it, it just felt kind of sterile that first year. Like like how are we going to make this work? Um, so I did a lot of you know things. I brought everything up dirty. It was just like I just wanted to fill the space with whatever cultures we had at the old place, and um, it all worked out. And it took a few years actually to kind of learn this facility. Uh, it still kind of feel like I'm learning it, but we're getting there. Um, you know, just the cellar having a really consistent cold cellar that was something I never had the privilege of having before, and um, it, it, it affects the wine. Sure. So the wines change because of that. So, yeah, that's that's been a challenge. Um, making more wine has been a challenge, and uh, that that's something that I had to admit to myself that didn't I didn't know how to do it. Uh, never worked in a big winery. Um, we're not a big winery. I just want to put that on record. <laughs> we're not a big winery. But uh, in you know from where we were and where we are from our four barrels to where we are today, making you know twenty thousand cases of Pinot. Um, it, it's, it's a bigger scale and I didn't know how to do that, so I, I hired people that had worked in big wineries and kind of used their ideas and their expertise. And, um, so that was a challenge. There's been vintages that are challenges. 13 was the most recent one. That was, that was, that was a lot of rain. <laughs> it was a lot of rain and I, I, I'd never seen that before. <laughs> um, so how did you respond to it? Oh, I did some things like um, uh, I brought in helicopters a very Burgundian technique to dry the vineyards before picking. So we would have them come as the crew was waiting and just dry everything. Um, there's a lot of surface water when you have that much rain, it's just sitting there. And so that was a, that was a nice little thing to do. Um, we also, uh, I did a lot of concentration. So that vintage, there was so much rain that uh, things came in the door quite diluted. Um, and it was just water, you know, taken up by the roots. Mm -hmm. So uh, I took off a lot of juice from the fermenters, froze it, concentrated it down, mm. and then added the sweet concentrate back, as opposed to adding lots of sugar. Took a lot of time, and that was, but I think it added some mid palate to the wines. So there were some things that I'd, I'd never tried before that vintage. That was really fun. That was a little, that was a little bit of a head spin. Like, oh, what do we do? <laughs> <laughs> so that was cool. Um, but you know, now I know that. Now I now I have that knowledge. It's stored away, and when we have that again. Uh, we'll deal with it. The challenges these days are, are just heat and hot vintages, early vintages, um, learning how to make wines that you still like uh, in a warmer year. So those are, that's kind of what we're facing these days. I'm sure we'll all learn. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you think that 
that's that what we can grow here is going to change in the next 20 30 years I don't know I hate to say that um, potentially though because I just feel like you know when I was a kid we harvested mid-october that was when harvest came that was it and you had a very small window you had October you started picking and it started raining pretty quickly um, you know we're we're mid-september and thinking that's late these mm -hmm. days you know and and late august is not strange so so things have definitely just gotten constricted the season's gotten shorter it's gotten warmer um don't see that changing so yeah i think so i'm planting some varietals this year that are definitely things we would not have planted 20 years ago um just to see mm -hmm. what they do uh but at the same time uh we're doing things like you know, going up on the hillsides, we're planting at a thousand feet pretty regularly now. Uh, and I think those are the sites that are going to really kind of maintain themselves. We're looking at clones that we would have discarded and did discard in the early days that didn't get ripe. Uh, they were very late ripening clones. Those are looking great right now. So there's things we can do to kind of mitigate, but um, I think it's kind of a stopgap and probably the region will change. Mm. The wines will change. Um, going to a to different varietals. I mean, it's happening. People are doing it. Uh, I think that's probably past when I'll be around, but I think it might happen. <laughs> so. so outside of your family, I'm curious who your other kind of influences in the industry are or have been. Well, I had a lot of influence from, from uh, people in Burgundy, so mm -hmm. I have very good friends back there that I still um, consult with and, uh, and respect. Um, there's people... Um, in California that I do talk to not a, not not a lot um, um, my other probably biggest influence is my husband who um, is also a winemaker maker and mm -hmm. went to Davis and so comes from a very different perspective than mine um, and worked in California for a long time so he has some knowledge on warmer climates which is great um, but he's also a very um, thoughtful winemaker and uh, has that technical training behind him, which, you know, I went to a school, but I didn't, it was a very practical-based school. Um, so when I have a real problem, he's usually my first ask. Uh, and as far as, you know, tasting blends and, you know, just what do you think? Sure. Uh, other peers in the industry, you know, Adam uh, Campbell at Elk Cove, we are the best of friends and um, grew up together, basically, have a very shared background. Mm -hmm. So um, he's the other one that I often consult, we consult each other. Um, he comes at it, you know, with no training except for his family. So he's really learned, but he had focus on vineyards more. And so when I have vineyard questions, I usually go to him. Um, there's other people in the industry. I mean, Steve Dorner is, is a very close friend as well. And, and I think he's one of the best winemakers in this area. Um, Dave Page over at Adelsheim is again, mm -hmm. a very well-trained winemaker so you kind of pick and choose your questions for the people that you want to you know what do you want to know <laughs> um, but you know there's a lot of people here that are uh, been here a long time now mm -hmm. and, and those are the people I respect mm -hmm. I, I I rarely go to people that haven't been here for 20 years <laughs> so because it takes that long to really understand so yeah I, I mean there's a good community here as mm -hmm. you know um, of people that are willing to help at any time so so I'm curious, speaking of Adam, I'm curious sort of what, what is it like working with, alongside people who knew you as a child and, and along with other yeah. second generation? Yeah, so it's great. You know, it's kind of like um, cousins you haven't seen forever, right? Because <laughs> you have this shared background. It's like you, you, you don't have to talk about how it used to be because we all lived it and we all lived it from the perspective as children. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, and we, we were together. I mean, there were these meetings that we would get together and we didn't know what they were talking about and we'd go off and play under the trees, you know, or whatever. Um, so there's this shared, it's not like we grew up together all the time and, and know each other intimately. It's just that there's a shared background mm -hmm. there. And so we, we do have a, a generational group that meets every couple months and we get together and, and kind of talk about where the industry is, where it's going, how do we fit in, um, what's our hopes and, and dreams for the next generation. Um, been really, really helpful to have that kind of uh, ability to talk about issues that, that we're all questioning. Mm -hmm. um, and we know the history of this, of this area. So 
we're all very, uh, I think the one thing is we're really protective. We're really like protective about the integrity of the Willamette Valley and what our parents worked so hard to build as a reputation for this place out in the world. And we look at ourselves as kind of these caretakers of that. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to continue that. We need to teach other people that. We need to make sure that, it, and it's going to get harder. <laughs> it's not like we can control it. Um, and uh, so I think that that's kind of nice is to have that kind of group of people that have the same kind of vision of where we should be and where we've been. Yeah. So I'm curious what it's like being a woman in the Oregon wine industry. Ooh, that one's a funny one. Um, these days it's really easy. Um, <laughs> when I started there was Lynn Pinarash. And she was quite young and you know, she's a little bit older than me and she, she was, uh, uh, came up here and took over Rex Hill. And that was strange in itself to have a winemaker, you know, to hire a winemaker that wasn't in the family. Mm -hmm. That was a big deal. So when Lynn came up here, it was like, wow, she's coming up from California, she's a woman, she's, you know, she's trained. That was huge. Um, so she was very intimidating to me. Uh, <laughs> and um, other than her, there really was nobody else that had an influence on me. I mean, um, I'm trying, you know, there was uh, Pat Campbell, who worked mm -hmm. in the winery a lot, but uh, she'd kind of, she was there, but, and Adam wasn't quite there, but it wasn't, it, it wasn't the same thing. So it was really just Lynn and I for quite a while. Um, Patty Green came along at some point, and uh, I'm sure there's other people I'm forgetting, but uh, it was difficult. It was it was difficult, and it, it was um, unusual. But I had experienced a lot of um, I don't know what the word is, but just that uh, France was very difficult. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> France was really difficult. There were you know there were people that very much did not want women in the cellar, and there were certain jobs that I was not allowed to do as a woman. So I had experienced this kind of in my training and. So when I came back here, it was more just a lot of being in the room with a bunch of men and kind of being the token woman for a long time, like, oh, yeah, we should invite Lynn or Louisa because we should have a woman on the panel, that kind of thing, which was great, you know, kind of you get out there. But um, you learn, and, and Lynn was really intimidating me because she was very aggressive and very, um, she just said what she felt. And I was always like, God, she's so rude, you know, she's just like so over the top. And then I realized I was getting that way because you kind of had to be. You kind of not rude, just kind of you have to speak your mind and you have to know, let people know that you actually know something, and that you, you know, have some experience to 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 uh, share, mm -hmm. and that you're not, um, you know, you. Well, for me especially because coming from the family, I was already one down, right? Mm -hmm. I was already one down. Oh, she's where she's a winemaker because she's family, so I had to really tell people and be very aggressive about um, the fact that I knew what I was doing and I had some expertise or something to add. So um, I think my sister and I have both kind of built a reputation in the Valley that we're, we're pretty outspoken and um, uh, part of that's just hereditary and being Italian and all that. But, but part of it is really I think our, share, our experience of just having to kind of put yourself out there a lot. And uh, these days there's so many women. It's so great. I mean it's just it, you know, you look around, everyone's, every, you know, more than half the resumes I get are from women these mm -hmm. days, and uh, uh, it's wonderful. So I, I don't think there's that pressure anymore. I don't feel like I'm being asked to be on panels because I'm a woman anymore, always, sometimes. Um, so, yeah, I think this is a good industry for women, but they really do have to prove themselves, <laughs> especially in the winemaking part, because it is physical, and so, you know, it's that same old thing. You have to prove that you're willing to do it. Mm -hmm. so. so did you feel like sort of the success of your wine made you made, made it feel like you fit in or made it feel like you were belonged? Yeah. No, I had to prove myself for sure mm -hmm. in that way. Um, yeah, I think that's very true. I think you have to, uh, probably more so than male counterparts, you have to make really good wine to be taken seriously, you know, meaning that you get critical acclaim and you get all the scores and you, you know, you know, find success or whatever it is, but you, you have to prove yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's no question. So you also have children. Uh, do you have yes, a thought? I have for a their slew of children. <laughs> do you have any <laughs> thoughts on their future in the wine industry? Um, not really. I, we, have, uh, we have four kids, um, ranging from 11 to 21. And 
my sister has two and my brother has two. So there's eight grandkids that um, are potentially looking at what we're doing and mm -hmm. thinking for themselves. And uh, we followed my parents' path of not pressuring, not no obligation. I mean, my father, my uh, husband has a winery too, so there's an option there. I, I kind of always make sure they know that. <laughs> there's, there's another winery you could work with. <laughs> but we try not to pressure. There's no, there's no, we never talk about when you guys come back to the winery or anything like that. There's no, there's nothing like that. And I think, um, uh, they're still young. So 21 is the oldest of the grandkids and uh, I was 24 when I even thought about this. So I think uh, we're letting them pursue what they want. My niece is definitely following my sister's path of uh, going to school in Boston, doing journalism, and she's been doing some great internships at, uh, you know, different food and wine related mm. things. And she, uh, I can see her coming back. I have a nephew in Italy that is just announced to me yesterday that he wants to go to neonology school. So that's cool, although I was, my response was, are you sure? <laughs> are you really sure? I mean, it's, you know, maybe you want to work a little bit and see if you really love it, because if you don't love it, don't come back here. <laughs> we want you to come back, you know, passionate, mm -hmm. educated, you know, bring something to the table. Um, so we've had to set up a little criteria for the next generation as far as what we expect. You know, we want them to go to school. We want them to go and work in the world, uh, you know, for so many years in the industry mm -hmm. um, and, and really make sure they want to do it mm -hmm. and, and come back uh, adding something and not just as a you know, last resort, what am I going to do with my life? They have to be here because they want to be here. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, it'll be interesting. I don't know how they, all the fallout will happen, but I figure I got about 10 more years in me. <laughs> and then I'd like someone to take over. <laughs> but yeah. So what do you see in the future for, for Ponzi wines? For Ponzi, uh, you know, we, my sister and I have, have got to a point where we're happy, where we're, we're at a volume, we're doing about 50,000 cases. Um, it feels manageable. We, we had a big period of growth there, mm -hmm. um, of building this facility, uh, the hospitality part of it, um, adding vineyards, and that was a lot and now we feel like we're kind of here and we want to just refine it all um, so I don't see us changing a lot I think it's more about kind of just yeah just making sure we're doing it and hitting it all cylinders and mm -hmm. making sure that it's all working really well we may buy more vineyard because vineyard land is going to become really expensive and we feel like we have an obligation to make sure uh, we have enough land mm -hmm. and when the prices are a little bit cheaper. So we'll probably purchase more land. Um, I don't know if we'll plant it, but we'll get something. Um, I don't know, the, the whole industry has changed. So it, it's hard to say. The whole industry is changing very quickly and we're feeling the ground move a little bit under our feet and how, how are we gonna fit into that? You know, that, that new kind of world of bigger money coming in bigger marketing budget, mm -hmm. you know, the ability to really move quickly on stuff. Um, it, it's a little scary. And so I think our <laughs> reaction to it is, okay, don't worry too much. Just keep doing what you're doing. Make sure you're doing it well, um, that you are being true to what we know how to do. We can't compete with, uh, you know, big wineries that come in here. We just can't. So we have to kind of... Um, hang our hat on our reputation mm -hmm. and our history and, uh, and do what we know how to do. So uh, that's Ponzi's future, I think. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. We've been approached, um, you know, to sell. Um, we don't have any interest in that. So that, that, that we do know. That's about all we do know at the moment. <laughs> So you mentioned the kind of rapidly shifting mm -hmm. Oregon landscape. What do yeah. you, what have you seen in the last few years, and what do you see happening in the next, say, 10, 20 years? Yeah, I think it, I think that there's a uh, the Willamette Valley has definitely reached a point of recognition in the world that uh, is we've proven ourselves as far as an, a region that is here to stay and that um, you know the wines are very well respected, the area is well respected. So. I think it's inevitable that we're we're going to see growth here, uh, and we've been watching it grow. But it's been it's been kind of nice growth, like small wineries starting everywhere. But now, 
in the last five years, it's, it's been big growth as far as Jackson family coming in. I mean, the ability to buy that much land so quickly is just, you know, mind-boggling to us. And, and there's, more, there's more potential for that. That's just going to keep happening. So um, going back to kind of the, the founders and, and people that have been here a long time, how are we going to protect what we've built? Um, there is a lot of uh, talk in the industry about how do we um, protect this brand, the mm -hmm. Willamette Valley, mm -hmm. and, and what do we do to kind of distinguish it um, from mass-produced wines that might start happening here uh, because we're known for quality. Mm -hmm. So there's, there's a lot of um, back and forth at the moment. In the, in the industry talking about how, how we should go about making sure that there's integrity and that we, we somehow let consumers know um, these are wines that are from the Willamette Valley and are high quality wines as opposed to wines that might, you know, our fear is that you start planting Valley floor, you know, get high yields and you really start making wines that aren't that great. Um, and so there's talk about it, ABA changes, things like that that might protect what's happening. But it's it's um it's going to happen. So we just kind of we're thinking get it get here where we are now. It's not going too far, and and maybe we can lay some groundwork. Mm -hmm. um, there's a there's a lot we can do. Uh, but what we can't do is is probably continue thinking we're a nice small little community that works together because um, it's getting very diverse. Yeah, there's just a lot of other things going on, and mm -hmm. um, so we all are finding our own little communities within the industry now that, that can work together. It's changing. I don't know. It's really, you know, in comparison to a lot of regions in the world, we're still super small, and, you know, it's all very, um, you know, able to get your head around it all, but uh, I think it's just the rapid growth, mm -hmm. and, I, and our land prices are, are cheap compared to most places now. Um, that's changing, but... but uh, you know, if I was in California watching, you know, drought and Pinot Noir that's getting too ripe and looking at California, I mean, looking at Oregon, you know, cheap land prices and making beautiful wines, of course you move up here. Of course you do. Um, so it's going to happen. I just hope we can kind of steer the ship a little bit, a little bit in the right direction. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. So what advice would you have for someone who wanted to enter the Oregon wine industry today? Mm. Oh, if you want to. Oh. <laughs> um, I mean, it's happening. You know, there's lots of young, I mean, the other part of this, uh, all the money coming in is there's this other whole other contingent of very young winemakers that are um, doing all kinds of varietals and all kinds of interesting things and, and not trying to compete with the Pinot Noir, but let's go do Tanat or let's do, you know, Tempranillo or something completely different. Um, and, and that's great. That's kind of bringing new energy into it. And uh, these are people that aren't, don't have capital. They're they're mostly buying grapes, sharing space, getting their label out, and trying to sell it. And I think that's um, that that I, that keeps the mix in in Oregon kind of fun and, mm -hmm. and, and vibrant. You know, um, if I was uh, young and had no money, that's probably how I would do it. I would you know make sure. Number one, I would go work. I would work in wine shops. I would work for a distributor. I would. Uh, make sure that you understand the sales part because that's where you get held up. You know, everyone can make wine. No, no magic there. It's, you know, <laughs> it happens. <laughs> so you can make wine. You can learn how to make wine. Um, it's selling it. And I think that's where people really need to make sure they understand business. They understand uh, what it means to be out there on the street selling wine, talking about it. Um, that's the hard part. So I would encourage people to make sure that they're comfortable with that part or have a good plan for that mm -hmm. part. Um, and then, yeah, work in wineries, just work harvest, go around the world. Um, try to just absorb as much as you can. Going to school, that's great. I don't know if it's necessary. Um, if I went to school again, I would get an MBA, no doubt in my mind. I, 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 Winemaking has come to me. I didn't necessarily learn it in a school. So, um, yeah, I would tell them to get, get a really good business degree or economics or something um, and, uh, and just work and, and really, you have to love this or you're not going to make it. You got to love everything about it um, or you won't. It, it's just not worth all the effort unless you love it. So. I don't know if that's good advice or not. That's, that's good advice. <laughs>
<laughs> kind of for everything, right? You have to <laughs> yeah, love what it you is. Do, right? You better love what you do. <laughs> so that's all the formal questions I had for okay. you. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Anything I should have asked that I didn't? Oh, gosh, I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. Well, thank you so much. Yeah.